All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings. My name is Stuart Sutton. As Managing Director of DCMI, it's my pleasure today uh, to introduce the DCMI ACES webinar series and today's presenter, Ethan Gruber. Uh, the webinars in the joint DCMI ACES series are provided as a service to the memberships of both organizations and to guests with the intention of improving uh, innovative development and practice of metadata. Today's webinar is an introduction uh, to Sparkle Queries. Our presenter, Ethan Gruber, works with the American Numismatic Society in the development of its website and the provision of access to the society's collections uh, of objects and its archives. At the end of the webinar, you'll have an opportunity to ask Ethan questions. Uh, we ask you to kind of hold off entering questions into the system until close to the end of Ethan's presentation. We have a very large audience today and we will get to as many questions as is possible within the available time. Uh, Ethan will be provided with all of the questions in the queue, as well as a means of responding to any that we're unable to address. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Ethan. All right. Uh... Thanks. Um, thanks for the invitation for presenting, um, first of all. Of, uh, uh, this is somewhat of a, um, a similar presentation to uh, something I gave in San Jose at the Semtech conference last August. Um, it's a little different in some ways in that uh, our system now supports some more advanced spatial queries uh, that weren't available last summer. And uh, we have a new ontology uh, for numismatic data uh, that we put into production earlier in the winter in February, which has changed uh, the Sparkle queries a bit. Um, before I get further on into the presentation, here are some URLs that might be useful to you uh, to follow along. Uh, the first one is especially useful, I think. It is um, a link to a blog post I, I put up earlier this morning, which contains a list of all the Sparkle queries that I plan to cover during the demonstration. It also includes uh, links to this slideshow um, in both uh, open um, LibreOffice format and PowerPoint. Um, I think it's pretty useful um, so that you can follow along uh, copying and pasting these Sparkle queries out of GIST um, and posting them into the Numisma triple store. Um, the first 10 or 15 slides of this presentation are sort of uh, traditional slideshow format and then um, once I get to the actual Sparkle query part I'll be switching uh, back and forth from the slideshow and copying and pasting the queries into the numisma.org Sparkle endpoint. Um, so if you have your own Sparkle queries, um, I think that makes it easier to follow along. Um, the second project is Online Coins of the Roman Empire, which is a project we began a few years ago. Uh, last year we received um, funding from the NEH for three years to uh, continue and finish the project. It is a um, type corpus of all Roman imperial types from Augustus to uh, Zeno at the end of the 5th century AD, which is roughly 40,000 distinct typologies um, of coins created during the Roman Empire. The second is a Coinage of the Roman Republic Online, which is a, um, a collaboration with the British Museum on publishing um, Roman Republican typologies, and that launched into production in January. Um, next is numisma.org, which is a uh, SCOS-based thesaurus of numismatic concepts. Um, each of these projects, I'll do a, a little uh, live demo so that you can see how they function. And there's a tremendous amount of linked data and Sparkle happening underneath, um, even though it isn't immediately apparent 
from the user interface that there's a lot of sparkle going on. And lastly is the link for Google Fusion Tables, which is uh, a really useful service that Google provides that allows you to take uh, CSV data and uh, create charts or create maps. And uh, this is pretty useful for um, the Sparkle queries because you can get CSV data directly back from our endpoint and then drop it into Fusion Tables to see a map or to create charts or something like that. So it's a, it's a way to get fairly immediate feedback for the um, some of the Sparkle queries that we'll be doing. So first, um, the problems in numismatics are not totally unlike uh, uh, problems that we see elsewhere in cultural heritage where um, there may be many different labels for a concept. So regardless of the language, um, the fundamental idea is the same. So there's denarius and denier and French and um, not quite sure of the Greek pronunciation but that's Greek. But these are all labels for the same concept of a Roman denarius, which is the most common silver uh, denomination minted uh, for about 500 years between the Republic and the Empire. And, um, and so following the principles of linked open data, each of these distinct numismatic concepts has been given a URI. Um, and that URI is unique. And you can go there in a browser and you can see information about denarius, or you can get machine-readable data about that concept as well. And so we can express a denarius as a set of triples. And I know many of you in the presentation perhaps um, already are familiar with these concepts, but I think it helps to cover it at least briefly before delving uh, into the Sparkle demonstration itself. So we have a URI for denarius, numisma.org slash ID slash denarius. It can have labels, uh, it can have uh, types, it can be matched with other concepts and other thesari. So um, this is a demonstration that uh, the URI for denarius has a preferred label of denarius in the English language. It has a type, a classification of NMO denomination, which is a class in the numisma ontology. And it is an exact match in the SCOS uh, ontology with uh, a URI, which is in the, uh, the Getty Art and Architecture of Thesaurus. So basically, um, a triple consists of three parts, a subject, a predicate, and an object. The subject, in this case, is numisma.org slash ID slash denarius. The predicate, or property in between, is also a URI. Uh, so SCOS pref label and exact match and RDF type. And then the third part of the triple, the object, may be a literal, like denarius, a string, or a number, or something like that. Or it may be another URI. And then taking this bit of fairly simple information, you can begin to establish a large graph of data from one URI to the next. So um, if you go to numisma.org uh, slash id slash denarius, uh, this is what you'd see. Um, it's basically some information about the concept of the denomination, uh, a list of links to the concept in other Thesari. You can also download um, this in RDF, uh, XML, and Turtle, and JSON LD, um, both through REST and content negotiation. So what is a coin type? Um, as I mentioned, uh, ochre is a list of Roman imperial coin types, and crow is re republican coin types. So a coin type is basically a combination of a number of categorical attributes, which, um, once you put them together, uh, form a distinct typology. Often these typologies have been studied um, and classified and numbered. So each typology in the Roman Empire has been given a distinct number. And that distinct number we can then convert into a URI so that we mint a URI for that typology. So this particular coin is silver. Its manufacture method is struck. It was minted in Emerita 
which is uh, in Spain. It is a, a denarius denomination. It was um, issued under the authority of the Emperor Augustus, and it also has a legend uh, or inscription on both the front and the back of the coin, and iconographic attributes. So if we consider these uh, categories in terms of Namisma URIs, we have material, um, and each of these is represented by a URI, and then the legend and iconography are, are literal descriptions for both the obverse and the reverse. So we have a URI for a coin type, and um, this particular coin type is in online coins of the Roman Empire. And what we can do from this point is once we have a URI for a coin type, we can then begin to link individual specimens, physical specimens in various museums or archaeological databases to that typology. So in this case, we have a coin from um, our own collection at the ANS, and we include the, the title and the collection physical attributes like the uh, weight and diameter, uh, URLs of images. Um, where it was found, if we know. Um, there are also hoards, which may contain coins of this typology. A hoard is generally defined as a coin or a, a collection of three or more coins found in the same archaeological context. Um, we can also link in coins from the British Museum, and the Berlin Munz Cabinet is also one of our partners. So um, taking a look at... Um, uh, Crow, Coinage of the Roman Republic Online, if we go to that site and we begin to browse the collection, we can see lists of Roman Republican coins, but you also can see uh, thumbnail images of these coin types as well, of the physical representations of a coin type. And these are generated from Sparkle. If you click on a particular coin type, you can see a map and a timeline you can scroll through the timeline and see how the fine spots change over time and get a sense of the circulation of a typology over time and space. Uh, these maps are also generated through Sparkle. Then you can get a list of examples of, of each coin type uh, with the weight and diameter and, and other sorts of attributes like that which are associated at the coin level. And uh, this is also generated from Sparkle. Uh, the same with weight analysis, uh, comparing the average weight of a coin type with the average weight of some other related attribute. Um, those are um, generated from Sparkle as well. And so in this presentation, I'll go through many of these different types of Sparkle queries that build these, um, that we can use to build these visualizations. But um, yeah, so we'll, I'll show some of these examples soon. So basically, uh, what I plan to introduce in this presentation, and I certainly can't get through the entirety of Sparkle because it's quite, uh, quite dense, but the idea is to start fairly uh, simply and then build in complexity um, slightly until the end of the presentation. So I'll cover uh, basic Sparkle syntax, filtering and sorting, uh, dealing with numbers such as averages and doing counts. Um, using optional to match things, um, merging different queries with union um, geographic queries, and then dropping some of these CSV exports from these Sparkle queries into Google Fusion tables for visualization. So um, if you go to namisma.org slash Sparkle, uh, this is what you'll see. And this is a Sparkle, quer a Sparkle query, the most basic that you can have where you have a, uh, a list of prefixes, which are basically abbreviations that stand in for a full URI. And these are the various ontologies uh, that we might use uh, within the Sparkle endpoint. Um, and then below that, we have select asterisk where uh, S for subject, P for predicate, and O for object, uh, these variables. Um, and then limit this to 100 results. So basically, it's doing the most generic sort of query that you can do um, of an endpoint where it just simply looks in, um, just gets um, a bunch of subjects, predicates, and objects and displays them in the screen. 
Um, and at this point, I'll switch over into uh, into the browser to give you a basic overview of of Numisma. So Numisma.org is a uh, an international collaborative project that's been around for four years now, and it has evolved considerably in terms of architecture and um, and data models over time. Uh, we have a scientific committee um, as well, which contains people um, partners from Europe. European institutions as well as the American Numismatic Society. Um, you can click on the browse link and you can browse through various uh, various types of um, concepts that we have in this in the system. So I can sort by mints or filter by mints and get a list of mints. Um, if I click on one, it will load up a um, that page for the mint, it will put um, put a point on the map where the mint is. Um, in more um, in other results, we might actually get a mint which has a number of fine spots associated with it. So Ephesus itself um, is here somewhere, and. Um, and these red points represent all of the places, uh, all of the coin hoards, basically, that we have records of that have that contained coins that were minted in Ephesus. Um, the Numisma site also includes um, a list of APIs and documentation, um, how to contribute data a page for the ontology so you can read more about how that works as well as download the ontology. Um, the Sparkle endpoint, of course, and a list of data sets, uh, which is a new feature so you can download individual data sets have been, that have been contributed into Ochre or into Numisma to power Ochre and Crow and other projects like that. So um, coming back to the Sparkle query itself, there are various options for getting results back. You can get an HTML page back for your query results, which is what I'll be doing uh, for the most of this presentation. You can get Sparkle XML results back, Sparkle JSON, uh, text, or a CSV uh, table. So if I execute this basic Sparkle query, uh, Basically, at somewhat um, somewhat of a random order, just simply uh, gives me a list of a hundred subjects, predicates, and objects. So, um, at this point, I'll begin to build slightly more um, complicated uh, query. So, as I already covered, uh, the subject and the predicate and the object are the three parts of the triple. So suppose I want to get a label. Uh, suppose I want to query Rome specifically. And Rome has a preferred label in the SCOS ontology, so that's the second URI. And then the label is the variable, variable that we receive back. So I'll just copy and paste this in here. And we can see in the HTML results that we have a list of labels in various languages. Now to simplify this somewhat, um, and this is the page for Rome. To simplify this somewhat, a prefix stands in for a full URI. So the prefix of SCOS um, a SCOS colon can represent um, this URI contained in brackets to the right, and the prefix of nm colon can stand in for numisma.org slash id slash. So instead of having a fairly difficult to read Sparkle query, um, we can begin to replace those with prefixes. Uh, makes it a little bit easier to, to read and manipulate. So I'll simply copy this and paste it back in. It's uh, uh, essentially the same exact query, but looks slightly different. So we just get a list of labels back from from the uh, from the endpoint. 
next we want to increase the query complexity a bit. So we still want to query Rome specifically, and we want to get the labels. Um, we also want to get the type, uh, the RDF type of Rome. Um, we want to get um, its field of numismatics, which is DC terms is part of. So that's a uh, basically a categorical distinction. And we also want to get um, the location of Rome. If we considered uh, Rome to be a concept of a mint, but this concept of a mint also has a physical location on Earth, uh, represented by a spatial thing in the geoontology. We can also get the latitude and longitude back for Rome. So we get a list of rows here because there are multiple labels. And so it will also show us um, a large list of things. There are also multiple types because it is both a concept in the Scoss ontology and a mint in the Numisma ontology. So we can refine this somewhat by using filter, um, which I'll get to on the next slide, I think. Um, but there's a simpler way of representing uh, this query um, by replacing uh, NM Rome with a, um, um, when you group uh, multiple lines together, you can use a semicolon. So in the first query, we have NM Rome several times, but in the second query, we have NM Rome, SCOS pref label, and then the label, semicolon, and then we can drop the NM Rome out from the, the following lines until we get to the point of um, delving deeper into the location of Rome. And then at that point, the location or the loc variable has a geolat of a latitude variable, semicolon geo long. So I'll simply copy and paste this in. And as you can see, the results are exactly the same. It's just an alternative and simpler way of representing the same query. All right. So in this case, we want to get the labels for Rome, but we want to order them alphabetically. And in doing so, um, we, we ask for the SCOS pref label of NM Rome, and then using order by ASC for ascending, um, you can cast the label as a string and order it in ascending order. Uh, you can also replace DE or ASC with DESC if you want for descending order. So copy that, paste that in, and now we get these in alphabetical order um, until you get to the point, I think, where uh, it doesn't know how to handle other Unicode blocks. And then the next label uh, we want to, instead of ordering, we want to filter, and we want to get only the English label. So we're delving into the Rome ID again, getting the label, using filter, uh, lang matches, and then the language of the label is equal to en. And we get one result, just the label. Next, we can broaden our query a bit. Um, instead of querying properties and objects directly within the Rome ID itself, we can make the subject itself a variable, and then that allows us to get larger lists of things. So in this query, we want to select all the mints, um, a variable basically of anything that is the RDF type of an NMO mint. Uh, in the Namisma ontology. This should give us several thousand hits. So yeah, uh, this is a list of all of the URIs in the system that are designated mints. Next, 
Next, we want to take this one level further. And instead of just getting a list of mints, we want to put uh, further queries on this. We want to get Greek mints. And not only do we want to get Greek mints, we want to get their latitude and longitude. And get the label of the mint in English. So um, we're getting the mints. Anything that's designated as a mint in the Numisma ontology, like the previous query. We're getting the SCOS pref label. We're getting um, all of these objects which are designated as part of the Greek numismatics uh, field of numismatics. Um, we're getting all those mints which have a, a geolocation. Um, and then we're delving into that location and getting both the latitude and the longitude. And as a result, we're only filtering for English labels. So in this case, we now have a table with the label, the latitude, and the longitude. And at this point, um, I can download a CSV file uh, by selecting CSV from the Sparkle endpoint output. Um, fire up Google Fusion Tables, which I find easiest to find by Googling Google Fusion Tables. You click here. I think it may require that you have a Google ID um, and sign in before you can use the service. Um, should be in downloads. There it is. So I've, I'm uploading the CSV that I just got from the Sparkle endpoint into Google Fusion Tables. Naming it Greek Mints. And Google Fusion Tables is intelligent enough to be able to recognize latitude and longitude points. So basically, as soon as you've uploaded this data into Fusion Tables, it will generate a map for you. So you can just click on the map. Uh, I don't know how some of these are uh, in the US. I'll have to take a look into that. But this is basically a list of all of the mints that are designated uh, Greek mints. Uh, in the MISMA, and as you can see, there are quite a lot of them, uh, well over a thousand Greek mints. So that's a, a good way to get started. You can also import this CSV data into GIS software uh, like QGIS and um, begin to um, filter and render uh, geographic information in a, in a GIS system. So next, uh, we are going to add a little bit of complexity. Um, we're going to begin doing analyses and queries on coin types, uh, specifically. Um, in this case, we can uh, begin to do queries on coins related to Michael Crawford's uh, Roman Republican coinage type defined by the number 273-1 which is published in Crow at the URI uh, in this bubble. So uh, in this case, we have a new prefix we want to use for shorthand for um, URIs or IDs in the Crow namespace. Um, so I'll paste that into the Sparkle query as I, as I go along. So in this query, we want to get um, all of the objects um, which have a um, a type series item of this ID uh, 273.1. Um, type series item or has type series item is the property we use in the Numisma ontology to link a physical coin to its typology, which is also defined as a URI.
So in this case, we have um, uh, a large list of objects which are uh, bound to this item. Some of these are coin hoards in um, Chris Lockyer's coin, uh, coin hoards of the Roman Republic database. Uh, some of these are physical objects in the American Numismatic Society collection or in University College Dublin or Berlin or the British Museum. Uh, to take this a little bit further, um, suppose we now want to get um, all of the objects that are part of this coin type um, and their weight. So this is a list of objects that we have and their weight as well, which is a decimal number. And now we can take this a little bit further and um, get not just the weight, but also the diameter of the coin. And you can see um, from this list, we've gone from several dozen coins perhaps to only two coins. Because what we're asking for in this query is um, our, we're asking for objects that have both a weight and both a diameter. So we're actually, actually restricting our query uh, for the coins which may have been weighed but not measured. Um, so we can use optional values in order to, to uh, gather a full comprehensive list of these coins, optionally display their weight if it is available, uh, optionally display diameter, and optionally display a, um, an image URL if we have it. So in this we're going to get objects which are part of this coin type, uh, restricting the class to a numismatic object, so a physical object and not a, um, not a coin hoard display the title, and then uh, get the weight, diameter, and image. So now we have a, a more comprehensive list of all of the physical objects associated with this particular coin type. Now we can take this a little bit further, um, and which is very useful for quantitative analysis of coins. This is something numismatists do quite often is um, observe the average weight of a coin type. Uh, this is particularly useful for um, analyzing the change in weight of a particular type of coin or denomination over time, uh, which gives some indication of the uh, economic conditions occurring at that particular moment um, with respect to inflation or other sorts of social or historical factors. So in this we want to uh, get all of the objects associated with this coin type and their weight and then using the average function in Sparkle get the average weight um, for this coin type. So the average weight of this coin type uh, taken from, say, 20 coins or so that we have in the system is about 3.83 grams. Um, if you take a look at these analyses over time and space, you can um, extend that somewhat to, um, to do queries such as, um, like, uh, what is the average weight of a denarius every five years over a period of 250 years. And in the Roman Empire, this is especially useful uh, because you can see the weights dip down, especially by the mid-third century AD um, during a period called the crisis of the third century when there's just a tremendous amount of inflation uh, and devaluation of coins. Um, as the silver content decreases over time and the cores of the coins are uh, less valuable materials which are lighter in weight.
So in the next query, um, we're going to dig a bit deeper in the graph. So instead of querying specifically for a coins of a particular coin type, what we're now going to do is get all of the types which are silver. Um, and also at the same time from um, an ID for Roman Republican coinage, which is a reference work uh, for the Crow project. So this query uh, just basically generates a list of all of the silver coin, Roman Republican coin types. And we can take this a bit further where we want to get all of the silver coin types and then get all of the objects that uh, are associated with those types. Uh, in this case, I'm going to limit it to 100 um, because as um, you probably would end up getting uh, 15,000 coins back or something like that, which would put a lot of stress on the Namisma endpoint uh, as well as probably freeze your browser because it can't can't handle that much information. So this is a, a limit of a hundred a uh, hundred physical coins that we have which are associated with uh, silver coin types. It should be noted that um, none of these objects are explicitly designated as silver. The silver distinction or the denomination or any of the other categorical attributes are extracted through um, um, through inference uh, from the parent coin type itself. Next up, we want to uh, extend queries with union. So not only do we want to get the physical objects that are associated with silver coin types. Um, we also want to use uh, union to get the types that are also um, made of gold material and limit that to 100. So we have once again a list of a hundred coins which are either silver or gold. Now we're going to begin uh, using the count uh, functionality in Sparkle where we want to get the silver coins, um, the objects which are associated with silver coin types and Roman Republican coinage. But um, instead of getting a list of the objects, we want to uh, count the objects and then return a variable called count. So um, as you can see, there are 16,299 uh, coins from several different collections um, in the system that are silver. Uh, from the Roman Republic. And uh, we can take this a little bit further um, and get the, the mints um, that are associated with these coins and then we can get uh, the English, filter by the English label for the mint and then um, group the total count of coins per mint and then group them by the label and then order them in alphabetical order by the mint label. So now we have a list, uh, a table uh, with all of the um, mints that were in use during the Roman Republic and the number of coins minted at those at those locations. Um, unsurprisingly, Rome is the the dominant uh, mint during the Republic. Um, and of course, these are not all Republican coins. 
Bitcoin types, but um, silver. So what I can do, in fact, um, from this table, since we have a list of labels and numbers, we can begin, we can uh, download this as well, create a new Google Fusion table, upload this new CSV that I downloaded into Google Fusion tables. Call it distribution of mints, I suppose. So we have labels and numbers, and once you have something like that, you can generate a chart. So I will click on the plus, add a bar chart. Um, um, increase the maximum categories. And then what we have is a chart that we generated from the CSV we just downloaded from the Sparkle endpoint showing the total number of, uh, of coin types, uh, silver coin types from various mints. Next, uh, we can do a lot more with geography, and this query is starting to get a bit um, on the, the complicated side in terms of using uh, union in order to merge uh, different types of queries together into a single result. So what we're doing with this query is we're getting um, all of these silver coins uh, that are from Roman Imperial coinage uh, reference work. So we're switching gears to Imperial coinage now from Roman Republican coinage. So we're getting all of the physical objects that are from silver Imperial types and their fine spots. We're merging that with all of the um, all of the coins which are part of a hoard and that hoard has a fine spot, so we're getting the fine spot um, through the hoard associated with the coin. And then we're using union to also merge that with coin hoards, specifically that contain references to silver coin types, but they themselves do not link directly to physical objects. So we're uh, merging those three queries to get fine spots. Um, and then we're getting the, the RDF type of the object so we can distinguish between coin hoards and physical coins. And then we're getting the latitude and the longitude of the fine spot. And optionally, if the fine spot has a name in the faux fontology, we will display the name as well. So paste that in. And now we have a list um, mostly consisting of coin hoards, which contain silver imperial coins. But there are a handful of physical objects here as well from the University of Virginia collection, which are um, linked to coin hoards defined on the MISMA.org. So we're using uh, semantic reasoning to to go through the graph and then extract coins which are associated with other URIs in the system which are defined as hordes. So this is a list of all of the unique hordes or coins associated with the query. Now if we want to refine this slightly, um, instead of getting a list of all of the hordes and coins, we just want to get a list of all of the distinct find spots we can select the distinct find spots with the latitude and the longitude and the optional name. The rest of the query is completely identical, but the variables we're asking for in return 
are slightly different. And this list is uh, a bit shorter because we've res restricted it um, simply to the unique find spots. We can also get this as CSV. Drop it into fusion tables, create a new one. We'll call this the uh, find spots for silver coinage. And um, you'll see that Fusion Tables is intelligent enough to recognize latitude and longitude again. And so we can generate a map um, of all of the find spots that we currently have in the system uh, for silver coinage. Um, there's one up here um, in Colchester, England. Um, this is the single find spot that we have associated with um, nearly 300 collection, uh, 300 coins in the University of Virginia Museum that are all linked to um, a coin defined on the, or a coin hoard defined on themisma.org. The rest of these objects, these points on the map, are find spots associated with uh, uh, the coin hoards of the Roman Republic database. Now in this case we want to do some basic filtering as well. Uh, we've already done a, a little bit of filtering, but we've only filtered at this point um, by the language of a particular label. So in this case, we want to get um, the coin types that have a denomination of denarius um, and have an end date um, of their minting, and we want to filter those um, denarii by um, the date between 100 BC and 50 BC. And then, um, like the previous query, we want to get um, all of the objects which um, have associated find spots, so the latitude and longitude for any object in the system that contained or is a denarius minted between 100 BC and 50 BC. And we also, at the very end, want to order by the date. So in this case, we have a, a table similar to the others, but the dates only range between 100 BC and 50 BC. So this, uh, like the last one, um, Actually, this seems to be exactly, yeah, I guess I must have duplicated a slide. Skip that. Um, and then we're getting towards the, the end of the presentation here, but the next um, second to last query is filtering by regular expressions. So we've done filtering by date, uh, filtering by language, and now we're going to filter by um, any coin type which has a reverse description containing the word Jupiter, uh, which is a pretty good indication that Jupiter appears on the reverse of a coin. Um, and then 
we'll get those coin types which contain Jupiter on the reverse and then we'll get the mint of those coin types, um, the latitude and the longitude of the mint, the label of the mint, and then uh, we'll also um, get coin types which were minted after uh, AD1 uh, using the filter function as well. So we're combining three different ways that we've used filter up to this point. And then we will optionally get the denomination um, of the coin and the denomination label uh, in English. And then we will order these by ascending order of date as well. Um, and what I'll do in this case, um, after showing the HTML results, I'll also get CSV and put it into Google Fusion tables. Um, so you see we have the the label of the coin type, label of the mint, latitude, longitude, uh, dates, and the denomination. So now we have a lot more information to work with, which makes fusion tables a bit more interesting in the, in the types of filtering that you can do. So I'll create a new table. upload the CSV that I just generated. Call this the distribution of Jupiter. So the data have been imported. And like the previous demonstrations, the latitude and longitude are recognized. Um, I'll change the map style a little bit so that the, uh, the points show up a little bit um, clearer. So we have, um, these are all of the mints during the Roman Empire which produced coins with Jupiter on the reverse. Um, we can filter um, filter these um, results. Let's say, suppose we want to filter by denomination. So at the moment, we basically have a wide variety of denominations to choose from. Uh, let's see all of the Aureus coins, which is a gold coin. So we're filtering. So only three of the mints uh, produced um, gold coins with Jupiter. Uh, we can combine that uh, with uh, bronze coins, so basically the same mints. Uh, denarius, so we have um, you know, a variety of, of um, filters to choose from in terms of uh, <coughs> visualiz visualizing the distribution of, of coins of Jupiter. Uh, what we can also do from this information is add a chart. Um, I'll create a, um, a bar chart and summarize the data in Google Fusion tables, uh, summarized by Mint so that we can get a, uh, a numeric distribution of the coin types of Jupiter um, and where they were produced. So we have uh, a table now, um, and Rome overwhelmingly produced the largest number of coins uh, with Jupiter on, on them. So finally, um, the last um, presentation, um, or the last Sparkle query, is something fairly new. Um, we began testing uh, this um, last summer or last fall, um, and then put it into production when we launched the new version of Namisma in February, which um, the Sparkle endpoint that we use under Namisma is uh, Fiseki, which is an Apache project uh, related to Jaina, which is a, a, a graph database and, and endpoint. Um, 
but Fuseki can be extended to interact with a solar index, a spatial index, uh, which allows you to do more sophisticated um, geographic queries. Um, so in this example, um, we can use the spatial uh, property nearby to get um, all of the locations which are within 50 kilometers of a particular latitude and longitude. In this case, this is the latitude and longitude of the city of Athens. So we want to get the latitude and longitude of all of those spatial objects within 50 kilometers of Athens. And then we want to get all of the hordes, in this case, um, mostly Greek corn hordes, but there are a few Roman ones as well but get all of the hordes that have a fine spot um, of the location within 50 kilometers of Athens. And then optionally, uh, we will display either the title defined by DC terms or the preferred label defined by the SCOS ontology. Um, I think this sort of query will open the door to new levels of scholarly um, inquiry. Um, in terms of um, combining different data sets together and performing really sophisticated analyses and visualizations. So we can see from this, um, uh, from this result, we have a list of coin hordes um, found within 50 kilometers of the city of Athens. Um, I could throw it into Google Fusion tables to generate a map, but I think you've seen a, enough of the maps so far, so that would be a bit on the redundant side. But uh, back on the scholarly um, scholarly applications for these sorts of queries, uh, this would now allow us to build user interfaces where somebody could draw a bounding box on a map, like uh, an open layers map, and get all of the uh, all of the spatial information within that bounding box. Um, it would allow us to import RDF data for Roman roads or um, RDF data for uh, the locations of temples or shrines or fountains or, um, or springs or anything like that and to be able to do, say, a, a query of all of the coins of Jupiter found within 100 meters of a temple of Jupiter, or find all of the coin hordes deposited within 50 meters of a Roman road. And then you can combine that with uh, different types of, um, of um, analytical or um, temporal queries to say, you know, show me the coin hordes deposited 50 meters from a Roman road within a week before the the Roman military marches through or something like that. So I think there's a tremendous amount of potential in these sorts of uh, spatial queries and linked data. And um, to conclude, um, thanks for your attention. Um, I know this is a fairly, fairly dense subject and I, I hope you've um, uh, learned a lot from it and can continue to learn from some of these Sparkle queries and just experiment with the system and um, make changes to the queries that I've that I've provided through the um, the blog post and through GIST and and if you have any questions feel free to uh, to email me or to find me on Twitter and ask me questions so thanks a lot well thank you thank you Ethan for the excellent presentation um, I would note um, that if you missed catching the links and everything and want to um, to practice the queries later, uh, within 24 to 48 hours, we will have on both the DCMI and the ACES website, um, uh, not only the link to the presentation itself, but also uh, to the a PDF of the presentation document where you can do cutting and pasting and practice on your own. So, it's time for a few questions. We have a few minutes. Um, let's start with one regarding regular expressions. So, this is a regular expression function question. 
um, what does the I, as in the character I, part mean in, here we go, question mark description, comma, literal Jupiter, comma, I. I've encountered the I before, but not understood. Oh, okay. Um, it means that it's case insensitive. So um, it will look for uh, Jupiter, lowercase, Jupiter with the capital J, Jupiter, all, uppercase, or whatever. So it's completely case insensitive. That's what the I means. Very good. Thank you. Another question. Does the speaker have any advice on how someone can learn more about a database they are unfamiliar with, like available values or parameters? Conversely, are there best practices for data providers for making that type of information available? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the database is pretty open-ended. Um, are we talking about a Sparkle endpoint or 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 not, um, you can usually, there are certain types of queries that you can perform on a Sparkle endpoint to get um, a list of um, ontologies that are used or properties that are used back. Um, and there's also some software, I uh, can't think of the name, that will basically submit queries to a Sparkle endpoint and then produce for you a human readable report um, of the endpoint. As for, what was the second part of the question? Uh, the, conversely, are there best practices for data providers for making the type of question, uh, uh, making the data providers for making that type of information available? Best practices, um, best practices. I, um, I don't know really. Um, I guess probably the lowest barrier to entry would be to use properties in schema.org um, or if you have a number of objects that um, that have individual URIs and are accessible on the web uh, to use RDFA, which is um, a, a microdata format that you embed in the HTML that um, associates some semantic um, um, some semantic categorization to the types of information you're presenting in the HTML. Um, that's a really it's a really complicated question. I'm not sure that I can answer it um, yeah, okay. in the amount of time that I have. But I, I think you could ask that on maybe the um, the LODLAM list, uh, which is the linked open data for libraries, archives, and museums. I think you could get um, m much more well thought out and uh, um, more useful answers through a list, I think. Thank you. Um, another question. Are you taking the approach of aggregating multiple sources of data together into one semantic database, or are you distributing a single query among multiple Sparkle endpoints? Um, there's one, one Sparkle endpoint, so we're aggregating the data into the one endpoint. Um, I think it's more scalable that way um, and faster. I think if you have multiple endpoints, um, then it just increases the amount of time that it takes to get a result back, which negatively affects the user experience overall. Um, the reason that we're able to aggregate these data is there's a tremendous amount of collaboration uh, in the numismatic community on using concepts defined on numisma and using the numisma ontology. Um, so that makes the aggregation uh, a lot more feasible for our domain. Another question. What software are you using for your Sparkle database backend and Sparkle query front end? The backend is Apache Fuseki, uh, which is open source and free. Um, the Sparkle endpoint 
on the MISMA.org is basically just a user interface, a wrapper on top of Fuseki. Um, the entirety of Namisma is um, basically done in Orbion, which is at its core an XForms engine uh, and workflow engine, but it does do a lot of the modern linked data platform types of things that we need to do uh, in the user interface. But the back end for Namisma is XForms driven for editing concepts and publishing them into the endpoint and managing data. I have two questions that are actually closely related, so I'll see if I can combine them into one. Um, and you've already addressed some of this, but what are the components of the uh, Namisma software stack and how does the UI generate Sparkle queries based on user input? The um, so the stack for Namisma is uh, Orbion, which is the user interface in the XForms backend. Uh, there's Apache Solar, which is the browser interface. Um, there are two Solar indexes, one for the browser interface and the Atom feed, and the other is only for the spatial queries, um, which are associated through the Sparkle endpoint. Um, and Apache Fuseki is the endpoint. Uh, so there are three open source Java based applications, um, two of which run in Tomcat, and then Fuseki runs separately as a service. Um, and in the user interfaces, um, we actually have XSLT doing some Sparkle queries. Um, or taking Sparkle results and converting them into KML or formats that drive charts and, and things like that. Uh, and then those things are rendered through open source JavaScript libraries like open layers for the mapping and uh, other, other things for charts or, or whatever, chart libraries. Well, Thank you very much, and I think at this point that we will end the webinar. So again, uh, Ethan, uh, thank you for um, uh, uh, an excellent presentation of, of queries, Sparkle queries, and for providing excellent uh, examples of the queries in operation. So, uh, Stefan, do we have any other announcements that we need to make? Uh, the only announcement to be made is that the presentation and the, the archived presentation and the PDF file of the slides will be made available within 48 hours of the live broadcast. And if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to the email address listed on the follow-up email with the slide archive and recorded presentation. Thank you. So thank you, uh, everyone who came today. It was a large number. Uh, there were over there were 500 people registered and nearly 260 that were present for for the webinar. So thank you very much and good day uh, to all of you. Thanks a lot. All right. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>